Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Lawyer Interviews. I'm your host, Jeff Dillon, and today we are going to continue our discussions about the recent arrest of Andrew Tate. As many of you probably already know, Andrew Tate is a widely known social media personality, and he has recently been arrested on charges for sex trafficking and along with his brother Tristan forming a organized criminal group. This recently happened in Romania and what we're hoping to accomplish today is dive into some of the the legal terms as many of us are not experts. Now, helping us today to accomplish this, we have Kristen Halkiotis. Kristen, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks um, for having me, Jeff. Yeah, of course. Of course. We need more experts like you to expand our knowledge. And Kristen is an expert. She is a defense attorney in North Carolina, a former ADA, and a law professor at the University of Elon. Is that correct? Oh, Elon University School of Law here in Greensboro. That is all correct. <laughs> Very good. So, you know, you cannot question these credentials. This is a criminal law expert, um, and we're lucky to to have her. So, Kristen, did I get that recap correct on what's going you, on? You did. You did. Um, and I will just say as a disclaimer, you know, lawyers always have to have a disclaimer. I am not licensed to practice law in Romania, just here in North Carolina. But certainly so many of these concepts are pretty broad and, and they, they're applicable in multiple places. So when we're talking about the generalities and definitions and terms, uh, we can certainly discuss all of those things today. We're discussing the different players here. Andrew Tate is a, a suspect suspect, correct, who's been arrested. And maybe we can first discuss just the nuances of these terms. What is a suspect and how does someone become arrested? When someone's a suspect, certainly they are suspected of committing a criminal offense. And, you know, that's determined by a law enforcement investigation. A lot of times law enforcement working in tandem with the prosecutor's office. And so when someone's under investigation, they're a suspect. And then things change a little bit once somebody is actually arrested, uh, once charges are actually brought against someone. And so in this particular case, we know that Andrew Tate has been arrested. Um, he is being deprived of his liberty right now. He is incarcerated in a jail facility under preliminary charges. As a criminal defense attorney, I would call that person a defendant, even though it would appear that under their system, uh, there's going to be formal charges potentially that issue later. Um, he's already under preliminary charges. He is being deprived of his liberty right now. And so, you know, I think he's he's gone from being a suspect, certainly, to being a defendant at this point in time. He started having court proceedings with respect to his detention. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're sort of past that initial suspect phase. We're into the defendant phase with him at this point. So what makes someone rise from the level of suspect to defendant? Is it being arrested? Um, it's having the criminal process initiated against you. And certainly, you know, he's at a point now he's been detained. He's in custody. He has certain rights that apply. Um, and that's important when someone's a criminal defendant, they have these certain rights that attach, you know, the, the right to um, have a lawyer, you know, the right not to make statements. Um, or forced statements by law enforcement, things like that. Mm, okay, uh, that's helpful. And now we can get the the terminology right. Now, I I don't know how this. You may or may not know how this works in Romania and the differences of their legal system in here. But I assume there you have similar players involved. We have a prosecutor, we have the defendant, we have a judge, defendant, he may or may not have an attorney. I assume he does. Who are the players involved? For sure. This so stage? we definitely. Sure. And and definitely we have those same players, for example, in our legal system here in the United States and the legal system that they're dealing with there in Romania, you know, you have your, your prosecutor who's a state employee or government employee. Uh, they're the government lawyer that's charged with seeking justice, seeking the truth, uh, bringing forth charges that are supported by probable cause um, and evidence um, and, and putting on and having the burden of putting on evidence beyond a reasonable doubt to convict someone at a trial. Um, certainly, I believe I've read some accounts that, um, you know, Mr. Tate does have a defense team in place. They've already made an appeal um, or entered an appeal on the detention that was ordered a, a number of days ago. Um, there is a very large difference between our system of justice here and the system of justice in Romania, it would appear. And that is our jury trial system, right? So in the United States, 
our our founders um, for whatever other flaws they may have had at the time. Um, they put something really important into our constitution, and that is the promise and guarantee of trial by jury if you are charged with a crime by the government. And that's really important. And they put that in there to prevent government overreach. Mm -hmm. uh, they wanted jurors to serve as a check on the government. And, you know, under the Romanian system, it would appear that um, there are bench trials and a bench trial is simply a trial in front of a judge. And so that's a huge difference. Um, hmm. between our two systems of law. Um, th th there's not a jury trial process there. Now, it's an interesting point. You bring that up. I thought we also had bench trials in the United States. Is there a reason that that can happen sometimes? Uh, there is. In, in many states, um, and I know in North Carolina, um, it's really been within the last uh, 10 years that that law came into effect that a defendant could request a bench mm. trial for a felony charge. And I'm not sure if all 50 states have that promise, that, that guarantee, um, but certainly, you know, we are guaranteed a jury trial. And sometimes, you know, if you're dealing with a case that's extraordinarily emotional, mm -hmm. um, where a defense is very technical, those there are limited circumstances where actually a bench trial might work out better for your client. And it's something that needs to be discussed. So there are outside um you know, situations where a bench trial could be in a defendant's best interest. Got it. But on the whole, you know, juries are, you know, you got to convince 12 people. Yeah. So it does work out. And that, I guess that, <laughs> the uh... state, yeah, the state has to convince all 12 people. All yeah. the defendant needs is one who holds out and it's a hung jury. Going back to the detention though, that's, that's like a point that people are discussing with this case that Andrew's been detained for a certain amount of time, even though he hasn't, you know, gone through proceedings yet to be found guilty or, or innocent. So, you know, why is that a hot topic in this case, the detention? So I think it's it's a hot topic. The way their system works, it would appear is that they can be detained for up to 30 days. And then the prosecutor has to go back and ask for the detention to continue. And of course, the judge did order 30 days of detention. And again, an appeal has been lodged by by his legal team. And I actually learned a lot from the last interview on um, on this show uh, with the Romanian lawyer who was who was on. And I remember he was talking about how, you know, it's one judge who passes on the initial detention decision. But then on an appeal, you're going to go in front of a panel of two judges and, and the two judge panel is going to decide that appeal. Um, I don't I, I can't find any accounts that 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 has happened yet. It'll be interesting to see but, you know, I, having been in this in this line of work for 18 years, um, I would be hard pressed to think that at this point in time, they're going to release him. You know, you have a situation where you have a foreign national, um, he's got a, you know, UK passport, uh, mm. he clearly has a lot of means, uh, financial means. Um, you know, I think any judge, regardless of what country you're in, is probably going to be concerned that he's a flight risk. Yeah. Okay. That well, that makes sense. And is being detained, is that the same as being in a jail? And then uh, what's the difference between that and a prison? That's a good question. Um, so detention is something that is generally referred to as what happens pre-trial. So he's in pre-trial detention, which is usually, which usually happens in a jail. Mm -hmm. um, and prison is usually where someone goes to serve a, an actual commitment from uh, either a guilty plea or a conviction at trial. Then they will be sentenced and sent to a prison. Okay. Okay. And a jail is usually a local facility. Got it. So in our in pop culture, when someone's like, mom, I, you know, come bail me out, you know, and the teenagers like, got caught drunk driving or something that they're in jail there versus exactly. the inmates escaping. They're from a prison because they've been convicted and serving their sentences. True. Yes. Okay. Uh, that's although cool. I have seen, I will say I have seen inmates who have escaped from local jail before. So uh, it could happen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm sure people want to escape regardless of <laughs> being Correct. confined. It's not a fun thing. No, I assume. No. So here's a, term of art, I believe, an organized crime group. What what is that? <laughs> what does that mean? It's like a mafia or? So it can be really any different kind of, um, you know, an, an organized crime group can can be kind of for the benefit of, of any particular kind of crime. Like you could have a money laundering organized crime group, right? You could have an organized crime group where it's alleged that they are evading taxes uh, to benefit corporations. You could have an organized crime group like we have here where it's alleged that they are 
uh, engaging in human trafficking and that they've committed offenses of rape while engaged in the process of human trafficking, which would make up that organized crime group. So organized crime group is kind of the overarching umbrella, right? And then the specific crimes that they're alleging that are making that up are uh, human trafficking and, and the rape charges that we've heard about in the media. So does that imply more than one person to create an organized crime group? Uh, and to be charged with that, um, does that imply that it would be Andrew Tate, his brother, maybe you need more than one person to make a group? Yeah, you would definitely need more than one person. It would have to be some sort of ongoing conspiracy that they'd have to be able to prove was going on. Got it. And to keep asking questions on definitions and ongoing sure. conspiracy, uh, what, what does that mean? Uh, it means that multiple people are engaging and continuing to engage in this criminal enterprise together. You know, that the, the state, you know, or that the government is going to be pointing to, for example, communication between them, you know, whether it's whether it's wiretaps or whether it's cell phone evidence, mm -hmm. um, phone records, um, things like that. And, you know, perhaps they also engaged with other people. We, you know, we don't I think it's it's too early. I don't know if enough information has been released. Uh, to kind of, uh, you know, know any more about that or to, to what extent other participants may have been involved. Mm -hmm. Understood. And I guess on the other side of this, of, of the charges, could you go into more what does sex trafficking mean as a legal term? Uh, and what what is that crime exactly? So that's um, going to be, it's going to depend on what jurisdiction you're in, honestly. And mm -hmm. so I don't, you know, I don't want to give you just your standard lawyer answer. If it depends, but it kind of does. Oh, we um, love you know, that we answer. State definition, we have a federal definition here. I'm not sure how they're specifically defining it in in Romania. Um, yeah. But generally, it's going to be a situation where people are being held in some capacity against their will um, and made to participate um, in, in sexual acts of some sort. Okay, understood. And, and I don't even think, you know, a lot of times it doesn't even have to be that, you know, someone gets snatched off the street and kidnapped. Um, there are other ways that that crime can be facilitated too. I see. It's, it's very helpful to to get that because yes, we do think of, you know, people being transported or uh, sold and exchanged or but it being confined and held against your will. It's a helpful, I guess, definition to think about. Now the, the police, they apparently have confiscated some of Andrew Tate's property. Why did they do that? What what is he gonna get it back? Is the state gonna make money off of it? What what is what is the situation there? So I'm not entirely up on Romanian civil asset forfeiture, but the experience mm -hmm. that I've had with it here in the United States is that when you are charged with uh, crimes, especially crimes where they're alleging that you have, uh, you know, cars or houses or jewelry or money that are really like the spoils of your criminal enterprise, the oh. feds are going to swoop in real fast and grab all of that stuff. And it's called civil asset forfeiture. Um, and so it goes to, you know, here in the United States, when that happens, it goes to civil court and federal court. And, and the reason that's important is, is because it's a lower burden of proof, right? In, in criminal court, you have to prove somebody guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. We have a presumption of innocence where you literally, the prosecutor has to put on evidence proving someone guilty beyond a reasonable doubt to get a conviction. But when you're in civil court, you don't have that increased burden of proof. So it makes it much easier for the government to uh, make a case that this is illegally obtained uh, goods or money or cars, houses, what have you, and to have them forfeited to, for the benefit of the federal government. Um, and so I would imagine you, you're working off a somewhat similar framework um, there, that they're going to come in, you know, if they're, if they're alleging that he's part of an organized crime ring where he's making money from all of this, um, then certainly I would imagine they're going to seize everything right now. Um, you know, sort it out later. I, I, I'd be hard pressed to think that there's going to be much, if anything, that that they're going to get back. Uh, defendants would be getting back. Correct. Okay. Is there a point where they have to prove, oh, this, you know, the money obtained from this illegal activity was then used to go purchase these items? Or is it just a presumption? Well, you know, the burden is not going to be as high to prove that as it is in criminal court. To, to say that they actually did that. So it's, it's again, it's much easier generally for the government uh, to just keep someone's stuff, even in situations where someone uh, might end up being acquitted at trial later on. You know, I will say, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see how this shakes out. But in terms of what the government can and cannot prove, obviously, it's, it's kind of too early to know because 
case is still breaking and we don't uh -huh. have a, a lot of a lot of the background knowledge yet. Um, but I'd be hard pressed to think that a prosecutor would have initiated this knowing that the eyes of the world are upon them if, if there wasn't something there. And that's not to say that just because someone gets charged means that they've done it or that they can be proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, but certainly this is a pretty high stakes situation. And, and again, the eyes of the world are upon them. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you're coming in, just as, as a former prosecutor, when you know something is high profile, um, you're going to make sure that all your ducks are in a row before yeah. you move. So a couple uh, more buzz terms that I think are, sure. are good to flesh out. The presumption of innocence um, that a defendant has before uh, criminal proceedings mm -hmm. have ensued. I assume we have that here in the United States and across the world, probably in Romania as well, or definitely. Uh, what does that mean? Sure. It means that until and unless a defendant is proved guilty beyond a reasonable doubt in a court of law, they enjoy a presumption of innocence. And that's that's incredibly important. It means that just because somebody's charged with something, it doesn't mean they're guilty. Just because someone gets indicted on charges doesn't mean that they're guilty. Um, they have the right to go to trial and, and force the state to prove every single allegation against them. And so we are presumed, my client sitting next to me is always presumed innocent until and unless the state meets that burden with respect to everything they're charged with. And with the stakes being higher, in this case, because Andrew Tate is famous and there's just been a ton of coverage on this. How does that play a role in this case? Is there a higher pressure on the Romanian government and on Tate's defense? What impact does that have versus a case where the uh, the defendants are not famous? You know, I think um, it can certainly, it can be a challenge for the defense. You know, certainly this, this trial has gotten, or this, this case already has gotten so much publicity. And, you know, judges are people, they read the newspapers. Um, again, we're not worrying necessarily about it, juror, potential jurors in, in mm -hmm. their system of justice, but you know, certainly um, judges are people and they've been reading coverage and they've been seeing what happens. And of course, their job is to put that to the side and listen just to the evidence that the government presents. But it can it can certainly be a challenge because there's so much more pretrial press, pretrial publicity and, and certainly more pressure for the prosecutor. Of course, you know, a good prosecutor is going to make sure that their I's are dotted and their T's are crossed in every mm. single case that they bring. However, in this situation, certainly this prosecutor knows that the world is watching. And and want and I'm sure wants to make sure that everything um, is squared away properly. And if things proceed and he is formally charged, what are what are the next steps there? So the next steps are going to be, um, you know, he's already got his legal team in place. It looks like uh, the next step would be, you know, going in front of a judge, being advised of everything that he's formally charged with. Um, discovery process will start at, at some point, um, so that all of the all of the evidence that the government has will be given over to him and his defense team. And then it'll be it'll be fascinating to see um, how the case resolves, um, whether it's a case that ends up going to trial, whether there's some kind of uh, plea bargain that's offered, um, whether he, you know, takes a plea bargain if one is offered. Um, mm -hmm. Or whether you know continues to trial, but it also depends, you know, what he's facing, how many counts he's charged with, and you know, other considerations. Is he charged with everything he could possibly be charged with at the get-go? You know, is it a situation where if he turns down a plea bargain, he could be potentially charged with more things? You know, we mm -hmm. know that prosecutors like to leverage; they like to charge as many things sometimes as possible uh, because that gives them the best chance at leveraging out a plea in a situation where you have someone who can be charged and convicted of multiple things. That's a, a, an interesting point um, because I know we said there's sex trafficking charges. Uh, then there's a, a separate charge of an organized crime group. Are there other charges involved in this case? I, I was aware of the, of the rape and, and uh, oh, human yep. trafficking charges and, um, and the organized and, crime. And rape is another separate charge from sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. So yeah. when you add all of these charges together, is that to the benefit um, or a tool used by 
the prosecution and the and is it something that the defense and the prosecution consider at that stage when they're I guess negotiating maybe a plea bargain. Sure, you know the situations where I negotiate pleas. You know, for example, on with my clients, whether I was negotiating back when I was a prosecutor or whether I'm negotiating for a client now, those are all things you take into consideration. You know, how strong the evidence is, what charges, what what your client actually charged with, what is the maximum exposure that they're facing, and what is the likely outcome at trial, and is the prosecutor willing to give you a charge bargain? Uh, is the prosecutor willing to give you a sentence bargain? And those two mm. things, you know, a charge bargain is, you know, you plead guilty to A, B, and C, I'll dismiss D, E, and F. The sentence is going to be in the discretion of the court. But a charge bargain, um, a sentence bargain rather, is actually where you're fully uh, scripting out a resolution, like a full sentence that, that both sides contract to say, this is how this case is going to go. There's going to be X amount of prison time or probation or whatnot. Um, and so you have all those parameters hammered out before you even go in front of a judge. Well, it seems like uh, even though case hasn't begun yet officially, there's a lot of interesting aspects to the case at this juncture, at this uh, procedural stage. So uh, I really want to thank you for taking all the time uh, to help us kind of dissect all of this and make some sense of it. It was really helpful. Thank you so much, Chris. My pleasure. My pleasure, Jeff. Thanks for having me. It's going to be a fascinating case to watch. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure we will uh, continue to make video content and get people's opinions on this. Maybe we'll even see Kristen again um, if she would be willing to to discuss with us. Uh, all right, great. Well, thank you, everyone. That's it for this video. Don't forget to uh, like, comment, subscribe, and uh, we will see what happens next.